few names are so closely woven into the history of modern science as this, the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Here work the giants of modern physics. And here, today, are working men who may well prove to be the giants of tomorrow. And here, more than half a century ago, worked another man whose name was to become world famous in a way he... W.G. Pi lived in a world few of us can remember. The sunset of a Victorian golden age. Nobody, including Pi, realized it was. For Pi, indeed, it was a time of branching out. In 1896, when these pictures were taken, he left the Cavendish Laboratory to set up on his own, a quiet spot on the river bank in Cambridge. He flourished and was ready for bigger premises by 1903. A historic year for science, as Lord Rutherford, who used many of Pi's instruments in his revolutionary work, said shortly before his death. A great change in our ideas resulted from the discovery of the electron and of the spontaneous radioactivity observed in the heavy, heavy elements, uranium and thorium. Sotty and I were able to show in 1903 uh, that radioactivity was a sign and measure of the instability of atoms, and that the atoms of uranium and thorium were undergoing a series of spontaneous transformations. Few of the citizens of Edwardian Britain knew about all this, and still fewer cared. They went on making the most of their sunset. As for W.G. Pye, by 1913, his sun was rising steadily, and he moved to the site of the present main pie factory. But even outside, the world was changing. Women, if you please, were demanding the vote. And the portents of a strange new kind of warfare could be seen. The first world war that was to try them out came soon enough. It brought unheard of changes. Women did jobs they had never dreamed of before, as drivers, conductresses, train guards, and for the first time, at the benches of Pi's new factory. For Pi, too, there were new tasks. Aircraft needed new types of compass. Guns needed robust and accurate sights. And as the enemy, too, had new weapons, new techniques were needed for fighting them. Against aircraft, guns were helpless without reliable height finders. In all these spheres, Pi played a vital part. In 1918, when peace came, it brought many problems. But the war had, at least, left a harvest of new scientific techniques for the recuperating world to develop. Guglielmo Marconi, for example, was pushing ahead fast with his wireless experiments. The Morse code was no longer enough. The day of radio speech and music was dawning and the pie factory helped it to dawn sooner. Pie's first radio was built in a week, and it worked. But the crying need was for a really efficient audio transformer, so Pie designed the first, and by 1924 were producing 200 a week. These were the first days of the British Broadcasting Company. Station 2LO on Savoy Hill was the beginning, in the 20s, of a revolution so vast that few as yet even began to realize its national and international implications. And these were the exciting days of the Wembley Exhibition, when schoolboys and grown-ups gaped at the growing pace of scientific discovery. But other things were moving already. In a little room in Soho, an obscure inventor named Baird was tinkering with the impossible, vision by wireless. Pi, too, were interested in the impossible. And while the giants of the 20s were catching the public eye, the Pi scientists were quietly thinking about the 30s and 40s. The 20s roared to their fabulous end while Pi were setting up their first television laboratory. There were big developments in sound radio, too. For example, the first superheterodyne set.
By the time Pi had reached the figure of 40,000 sets a year, it was still only 1933. But that particular shadow had not yet shut out the European sun. Britain celebrated its King's Silver Jubilee in 1935. In the same year, Pi set up a special section to manufacture TV tubes and valves, for television was just round the corner. But sound radio was still the great 20th century town crier, for good news or ill. For 1936 was the year of the Three Reigns, and the new king who followed his father's coffin was soon to give place to his brother. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York. The start of a new reign, the birth of a new medium. King George VI's coronation was the first major national event to be watched by ordinary people in their own homes. Television had arrived. BBC television experimented and expanded. So did Pi, and soon they were selling a third of the TV receivers on the market. But the storm clouds were gathering for World War II. No time to think of television now, but the effort had not been wasted. It was to bear unexpected fruit after Dunkirk. An urgent problem faced the boffins for in various spheres of modern war, optical methods of range and direction finding were hopelessly out of date. Pi had been working on radar for two years and now turned their whole TV section over to it. And Pi's TV valve and chassis were the basis of all radar sets built by hundreds of companies in the next three years. Meanwhile, Pi's radio experts were busy. They were not satisfied with existing army sets and designed their own, cheap and mass producible. It was so outstanding that it became the pattern for a whole series of army sets that were made all over the Allied world. Another ACAC problem was being discussed between Pi and the government as early as the 4th of September 1939. The possibility of making shells detonate automatically within lethal range of an aircraft by fitting them with radio fuses triggered by a reflected signal. Combined with modern radar techniques, this would vastly improve ACAC performance. But no valves existed small enough and sturdy enough for such a fuse. So Pi designed one. Pi's production lines were fully occupied, so the design was passed to America for manufacture. And the almost miraculous proximity fuses were ready in time to tip the scales in the battle against the flying bomb. The final tremendous onslaught into the crumbling heart of Hitler's Reich, and the ordeal was over. The world gave a sigh of relief. But the road back to normal was a long and hard one. As before, World War had left a big legacy of new inventions to be developed for peace. Pi were eager to expand their television side. For this, it was essential to get programs on the air again. So the company devoted much effort to fighting politically for a resumption of BBC TV. It was, in fact, resumed in June 1946. But although Pi TV sets were quickly available, it was not until 1949 or 50 that the BBC chiefs realized that the enthusiasts were right and television was here to stay. Pi were as prominent as ever. Their new TV set, the B16T, was the best on the market for the first two years. Meanwhile, wartime developments in communications also had a job to do in peacetime. So Pi founded a new subsidiary, Pi Telecommunications Limited. One of its early achievements was the first private mobile radio scheme in Britain for a fleet of Cambridge taxis in 1947. Pi were first in the field, and now over 80% of all mobile radio telephones in Britain are built at Cambridge. Pi expanded the idea to link up with the GPO, and in 1959 produced a system whereby, for example, a manager at his desk can telephone one of his salesmen on the road. Pi Telecommunications, which started in 1946 with about 100 people, now employs about 2,000 and markets in 90 countries. The telecommunications field is far wider than radio telephones. For instance, Pi have developed a blind landing system, ILS, which is used throughout the RAF. This system, which is the basis of hands-off landing, 
has proved so successful that it is also being installed at several airports in many parts of the world, including Hong Kong, Moscow and Geneva. Pi telecommunications have their eye on space as well. Their engineers designed and supplied the equipment which in 1959 transmitted the first message ever to be sent across the Atlantic via the moon. tiny transistor is just one of the developments that help to make modern equipment more compact and at the same time more robust. The printed circuit is another. In these and many more aids to miniaturization, Pi were first in this country. Pi Telecommunications' latest baby, the first electronic telephone exchange in the world, is a fine example of this trend towards compactness. It is smaller and cheaper than anything of its kind that has gone before. Meanwhile, Pi have maintained their leadership in the home radio and TV field. But they were not only concerned with receivers. Having fought harder than any other company to get BBC TV and ITV on the air, they helped to create a worldwide demand for new transmitting equipment as well as sets. They exported outside broadcast units to Russia, Belgium and many other countries. also exported complete permanent transmitting stations. In Baghdad, Pi engineers designed, built and initially operated the first TV service in the Arab world. They launched the service in Thailand. Today, viewers in lands as far apart as Spain, Finland, Japan and Australia enjoy their nightly programs thanks to equipment built in Cambridge. There was a big market at home too. The company does not only make equipment, it plays an active part in independent television itself, being a substantial shareholder in ATV. And as new regional services open up, so more new transmitters are needed. This one is being built at Cambridge for the Devon and Cornwall service. But entertainment aside, Pi pioneered in other television applications. Here is a recent closed-circuit television system in use between branches of a Manchester bank. Pi's first experiments in this field were in 1952. From this has grown a range of equipment which is compact, versatile and far less costly than normal studio equipment. And its use has expanded enormously. For example, on the Shell building site near the Festival Hall, for inspection in places where it would be dangerous for a man to go. For microscopic work in research laboratories. By the police at awkward traffic points. operating theatres. And when an airliner crashed in a Swiss lake, the task of recovering every scrap of wreckage from the soft mud of the lake bed would have been insuperable without Pi closed circuit television. This, by the way, was the first use of a television graph. Once again, the moon. Television has added a valuable instrument to the armory of the astronomer. And now, as we reach the present, let us take a look at the ironmongery of the future. 
For those who work in it, and for anyone who grasps the pattern of today's world, Pi Instrument Group is perhaps the company's most exciting investment in tomorrow. Already we are surrounded by automation. Tomorrow, automatic machines will be the bricks and mortar of our civilization. And Pi make the instruments which control those machines. They also make instruments which carry the science of measurement to new levels of perfection. For example, Dr. Vivian Fuchs's party, exploring Antarctica, were able to measure the thickness of the ice thanks to seismic detectors and recording cameras built for the job by Pi Instrument Group. Another group project is the radar display system installed in HMS Victorious for the Admiralty. The electronic lung, which can be used in all cases of breathing difficulty, including paralysis, was developed by W. Watson and Sons, a member of Pi Instrument Group, in cooperation with Cambridge. More success in the medical field, the Soniscope, a sensitive and selective electronic stethoscope which, with its associated cardiophone, can amplify and record the faintest sounds inside the human body. This instrument is a product of another group member, Faraday Electronic Instruments Limited. Another instrument group member is Labgear Limited. Their speciality is counting electronically. And when you want to count at rates of a thousand or even a million a second, only electronics can help you. According to the problem they are faced with, Labgear assemble and modify, if necessary, a combination of their basic instruments, or building blocks, as they call them. Here is one of Labgear's sets of equipment in action recording the behavior of a liner hull model in a testing tank. Labgear has designed over 50 of their building blocks and are producing more every year. The phrase member of the Pi instrument group means what it says. Pi do not swallow small firms. They give them the support of a powerful organization while at the same time giving full scope to their individual traditions of skill and craftsmanship. Unicam Instruments Limited is just such a member. Founded by three craftsman brothers, of whom this is one, Mr. John Stubbins, it had not the financial strength to stand on its own. But since it became a member of the group, Unicam, with Pi support, has added the skills of optics and electronics to its experience in precision mechanics. There has resulted a range of absorption spectrophotometers second to none, which sell on a worldwide market against international competition. The oldest firm of them all, WG Pi Limited itself, is not a big concern compared with some of its lusty children, though it's big enough to need new premises. It makes the best equipment over a wide range of electrical, optical, and chemical measuring instruments. And it leads the world in a fascinating field of gas chromatography. The Pi Argon Chromatograph is so sensitive that it can check the flavor of a popular drink by analyzing its aroma or detect the minutest adulteration in a food product. Industry is only beginning to discover the full scope of this remarkable technique. Pi, of course, is not confined to Britain. Pi subsidiaries in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, and Canada repeat on a large or small scale and with local variations the pattern we have described. This was yesterday. This is today. This was yesterday. This is today. This was yesterday. This is today. Since we began, we have traveled a long road of which the modest instrument maker of 1896 would certainly be proud. And what of tomorrow? There is no limit. For Pi stands for an attitude to industry, a marriage of strength with adventure, of soundness with imagination. <laughs>